Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. All right, so uh, good evening, cowboys and cowgirls. All right, that's, that's, that's more like it. I was, I was hoping I wasn't going to get a, a Colorado State uh, 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 welcome reception, but you guys seem uh, like, you're, uh, like you're ready to go. Uh, very happy to be here. Never been to Wyoming before. Um, this is, you guys have a beautiful campus. Um, only one, one small, small issue, no oxygen. <laughs> no oxygen here. I was just like, even coming up here, coming up the stairs, I felt like a fat man on a treadmill. I, I noticed why all of you guys are in such good shape, it's just to survive. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have to be the smartest kids in the nation to study with such low oxygen levels. <laughs> like, this is must be, you know, they talk about Olympic training for athletes in the heights. You guys are like Olympic a academics. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And, uh, now, before I get into my, uh, my speech, I'd like to give you guys a little bit of background about myself because, you know, knowing a little bit more about me will help you uh, understand uh, a bit about my opinions. So, now the first thing, I'm a little bit older than you guys, or than most of you, um, than some of you, and uh, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking, through the, looking through the crowd and as I see, I see some gray, so maybe I'm not older than all of you. But for those that I am older than, uh, I'd like to just give you some perspective on, you know, what, what, was, what was my life like when I was sitting in your shoes when I was in college? Um, so, you know, when I was, you know, in your shoes, this was the president, you know, this was the president, and now this is your president. <laughs> now, when I, was, uh, when I was in undergrad, the big thing was, was email. Everybody got an email address. And you can, you know, email people digitally and talk to them. Now it's, uh, now it's this thing. It's Twitter, um, and maybe it's even something newer. There's probably something new. I don't, I don't do Twitter because no one needs to know what I'm doing. I don't know. No one needs to know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, no one cares. I, I, I'm not on Twitter because I don't want to get on Twitter and find out that I have three followers. So <laughs> next, when I was, uh, when I was in your shoes, Northwest was a direction. Now apparently this is a person. <laughs> of course, that is uh, Kim Kardashian and, uh, and uh, uh, Kanye West's child, North West. <laughs> so a little bit more about me on a, on a serious, uh, on a more serious note. As mentioned, I'm a husband. Um, as you can see, that's my that's my wife Danielle, and I'm also very lucky. Um, I'm married up, so um, I'm a husband. I'm a dad. Uh, you see my two boys there, uh, Simeon and Jeremiah. Simeon is just doing the H and O H I O uh, right now, so he's just getting getting into the Ohio State spirit. I'm also a brother. Well, not that kind of brother. <laughs> Study. So I'm an engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer, I've been a mechanical engineer uh, throughout my studies. So undergraduate in mechanical engineering, graduate in uh, PH, a master of PhD in mechanical engineering, and now I do research. So some of the things I research, I actually, this might not sound very exciting, but it is. I look at the way droplets impact surfaces. So I look at things like rainfall and how droplets on soil or droplets on uh, artificial surfaces behave once they hit uh, those porous surfaces. I also look at, uh, I gave a talk earlier today on this, uh, my group looks at ways of storing energy, and so we look at alternative methods for, uh, for energy storage. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of solar energy. Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of wind energy. And so one of the big, the big issues with those, uh, those two areas is that they're intermittent. Intermittent in the sense that the wind only blows when it blows. It's not blowing when you want a cup of coffee. It only blows when it blows. And so if you want to have that energy from the wind, you need to have energy storage. And so we're working on ways of making intermittent renewable energy store, uh, sources uh, more and more viable. Now, let me, uh, let me get into my talk a little bit because uh, we're here to talk about faith. And so um, what is faith? 
Uh, a question that many of you might have, um, and a question that, um, that I've been asked is, is it possible to truly practice science while also holding on to faith in God? Some of you might be wondering, how does an engineer at a place like MIT become a Christian? Aren't the scientific method and religious faith actually opposed to one another? Now, I would argue that science and faith are not in opposition, but actually work very well together. To illustrate my point, first I'm going to offer a definition of faith, because I believe we need to understand, um, we need to come from the same point. So I want you to understand my, my definition of faith. Next, we'll talk about how faith has been present at the frontiers of science all throughout the history of science. So I would argue that faith is not just something that's congruous with science, but actually works with science. And lastly, I'm just going to discuss my own faith and how I believe, like a hypothesis in science, you can actually test your faith. So if we're going to talk about faith, we first have to be on the same page and come with a working definition. So if you're like me, what's the first thing that you do when you're going to study, when you're looking at a new subject? Google search. <laughs> right, so you go to Google, now, thankfully for us, just like a Gundam style and University of Wyoming's Harlem Shake video, um, <laughs> Faith actually has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> now, some of you might have actually uh, Googled me. If you Google me, these are the things you find. Um, you see some talks. Unfortunately, my, uh, my Harlem Shake video does not make the, the top list. Um, so now, if we go to uh, Faith on Wikipedia, Wikipedia will tell you faith is confidence or trust in a person or thing or a deity or in, um, or in the doctrines or teachings of a religion. It may also be belief that is not based on proof. Now you'll notice here that faith is firstly a trust in a person or thing. You may not think you have faith if you don't believe in God, but in fact all of us exercise faith from the moment we wake up in the morning um, to the end of the day. Now, I'm a parent of two young kids, and for those of you that are parents, when you become a parent, what you'll know is you develop all kinds of theories about how to raise children. But to be honest, a lot of those theories are based on faith, because you know nothing <laughs> about raising children. Now, I was speaking to a friend of mine one day, and uh, he told me this, uh, this interesting story. He said, you know, our son is in this new school, and we, we absolutely love it. It really helps bring out a child's creativity. And so this piqued my interest. I have kids. I want them to be creative. And so I asked him, well, you know, exactly how do they do that? Um, he said, for example, they have a rule that children are not allowed to play with single-use toys at home because they stifle a kid's creativity. So rather than giving them something like this, a remote-controlled car, he might give them a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and encourage him to go outside and discover all the things that he can do with this wonderful stick. So I thought to myself, well, that, that, that's kind of weird, um, <laughs> but it's definitely cheaper. <laughs> Perhaps this might be a valid parenting method. Then I thought about it, you know, I could just see Christmas at this kid's house. He runs downstairs expecting an Xbox One, and there's a nice shiny rock. <laughs> Who needs an Xbox One? Then I thought more about it, and I began to wonder, you know, about all the toys that this kid, uh, kid would miss out on. Can he never ride a bike? Right? You only use a bike to mask how slow of a runner you are. <laughs> you know, what about, what about video games? I grew up playing a lot. Anybody here play video games ever? No. Okay. I grew up playing a lot of video games when I was, you know, Madden was the thing, and of course Madden is still one of the things. Um, but, you know, what about video games? There's only one controller. So, you know, but with that one controller, you can do so many things. You can be LeBron James. You can be a sniper in Call of Duty. Or you could be an enterprising young entrepreneur. <laughs> this kid is going to miss out on all of these wonderful experiences. The next thing I ask is, well, what about, uh, what about the swimming pool? Right? You only use the swimming pool for swimming. But actually, it turns out the swimming pool for boys is, is multi-use. So, see, I've altered the pool. <laughs> Pray I didn't alter the pool. <laughs> Now, there's no way that my friend knows for sure how all of this is going to turn out. Any of you who are, who are parents, there's parenting books that say one thing, and then you, you read on the subject more, you read five books, and you'll get five different opinions on the exact same subject. But you have to act, right? Because you, you are a parent. You have to do something, right? That action that you take, I would argue, is based on faith. You have some incomplete information. 
You have some beliefs, but you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. You don't know that this uh, method of parenting, whatever it is you're doing, is going to lead to the outcomes that you like. But you have to act, and you're acting, in my opinion, uh, based on faith. So, what is faith? I would argue that faith is belief in a person or thing with incomplete evidence. Faith is belief in a person or thing with incomplete evidence. It's not lack of evidence. It's not no evidence whatsoever. It's incomplete evidence. You just don't have the full picture. So some of the most important decisions you'll ever make are based on faith, or in other words, with incomplete evidence. Now, in fact, people exercising enormous amounts of faith or with incomplete evidence have made some of the greatest achievements in science. Now, as you guys know, I'm a professor at the university, so my job has uh, really two aspects. One aspect of the job is teaching. And so I have students, much like many of you in my classes, and I'm teaching them material. I'm teaching them what is known. I'm teaching them what is in textbooks. But then the other aspect of my work is discovering what's perhaps not known, going beyond what's in the textbook and um, determining and using physical principles to find out, well, what is possible? What is beyond our current state of knowledge? And that's, uh, that's what's known as research. Now, how does one go about conducting scientific research? It often starts with a hypothesis or an idea that has taken on faith. Every good proposal I've ever written wasn't guaranteed to succeed. Every device my group has tried to make wasn't guaranteed to, to work properly. But if I only did things that I knew were absolutely going to work, that wouldn't be research at all. Right? The nature of research is doing things at the frontier where you don't know that it's going to happen. You might have some incomplete evidence. You might have some, um, some inkling that it will, but you don't know absolutely for sure. This is the nature of scientific research. You take a risk on an idea with some information suggesting it will work, but not complete information. I would argue that the very best scientists exercise enormous amounts of faith every single day. This is, in fact, what might make them so successful. So I'll give you some examples, first of my own and then some, some others. So when I entered graduate school, I was tasked with designing a new type of fuel cell that incorporated very special pumps. Now fuel cells work by converting chemical energy in a fuel to electrical energy, waste heat, and water. You can almost think of them as a hybrid between a combustion engine and a battery. So a battery takes chemical energy and converts it directly to electrical and can do so potentially at high efficiency. But a combustion engine takes a fuel and as long as you supply the fuel, it continues to operate. Right? Your battery has a finite amount of charge. Some of you perhaps haven't charged your phone battery and you're wishing you could get on Twitter right now and you can't and instead you have to listen to my speech. Right? So for a battery, you have a finite amount of charge with a finite amount of power um, and once that power is spent, you must recharge it. Conversely, for an internal combustion engine, as long as you have gas, it continues to run. A fuel cell is almost like a hybrid in between the two, in the sense that it needs a fuel source constantly supplied, but at the same time, it's converting that fuel directly from chemical energy to electrical energy. So you can think of it as a hybrid between the two. Now, there was one issue with many fuel cell systems, and that's that this fuel cell, they produce water, and there's a delicate balance between the water you produce and the amount of water that's needed for operation. So these cells need some small amount of water in order for their reactions to proceed efficiently. But if you get too much water, you actually get flooding, and this blocks your, your fuel and your reactants from, um, from, um, from operating on the cell. Now, there was an idea um, in my, uh, in my uh, PG advisors group that perhaps there could be a way of in incorporating these special microfluidic pumps to remove the water directly from these systems. Now these pumps could potentially be small, low cost, they had no moving parts, and so this could be a great, uh, a great benefit for these fuel cells. Now there was one problem, before I got there, there were actually two PhD students, um, actually not two PhD students, two postdocs, so two people who already had PhDs that had tried to make this work unsuccessfully. So they had been working on it for almost a year and were unsuccessful. In fact, when I was put on the project, they told me it's never going to work. Oh, you little thing. <laughs> so, now mind you, in this process of working through the system, it was very challenging. What was going to keep me going? I already had some evidence suggesting that it might not work. There was nearly a year's worth of, um, of effort by two people more senior than me who were unable to get it to work. What is it that kept me going? The thing that kept me going was faith. Faith that this idea had some merit. Faith that this thing could actually work. Faith that I could get it done. Ultimately, I did get it done, 
And um, I was able to build this special fuel cell. So I'll show this quick slide. So this is what this fuel cell looks like. And the, the thing you see at the top is a special pump. This pump has no moving parts. It uses something called electroosmosis. And so when you place water in contact with glass, glass actually acts like an acid and will donate a proton to the water. And you get a negative charge layer on this, um, on this glass. That negative charge layer then draws positive ions from the solution close to it. So there's a thin layer of positive ions in solution. Now if you apply an electric field or you apply a voltage to uh, across this, uh, this very thin charge layer, that thin charge layer can move. And when you have very small channels, it's like a conveyor belt. So imagine the walls, imagine you had a, uh, a channel with, uh, filled with syrup, something very viscous, and then you start to move the walls. If you start to move the walls, that syrup will move with, the, with, the, with that system. When you have a very small channel, water inside a very small channel might as well be like syrup. The viscous effects dominate. And so you apply this potential, the charges along the wall move, and you can get pumping with no moving parts. So these are pretty cool devices, and we integrated them with these fuel cells. And they were, um, they were a very big help for these systems. You could run at a much wider operating range with these, uh, with these, with these pumps incorporated. So now, if I had decided to listen to the people before me who said this thing was never going to work, I never would have gotten a PhD. Right? So in this particular case, my faith in this idea, my faith in my own you know, talents and abilities to make this thing work actually led to uh, me getting a PhD. Now there's several other examples in science um, of things like this with much more impact than, than my fuel cell. So now one example is Thomas Edison and the light bulb. So there's a picture of, uh, of Thomas Edison. Now actually, the story begins well before Edison because several other people had tried to invent incandescent light, light bulbs decades before him. However, Edison sought to create a low-cost incandescent light bulb that would make gas lamps obsolete. Others have made incandescent bulbs, but they were fraught with difficulties, excessive power, including excessive power consumption, high costs, and very limited lifetime. Now, Edison maybe had a little too much faith, so he was so sure of himself, he proclaimed to the media that the end of gas lighting was at hand. And this was two years before he ever got it done. <laughs> so imagine, you know, Apple comes out with, a, with an iPhone. Right now, they're going to announce the iPhone 7. <laughs> now. And they don't even have the thing built. That's essentially what, what Edison did. He said, the end of gas lighting is at hand. Now, two years later, people, you know, they pulled out those press clippings and they said, well, Edison, where, where is this light bulb? Now, people began to chastise him, publicly denouncing him as a fraud, a pseudoscientist, and basically a con artist. Now, in spite of this adversity, Edison and his team, he had a team of scientists working with him, continued to press forward. Now, one of the key components missing in Edison's design was the proper filament material to allow glow discharge, glow discharge without incinerating. Over several months, Edison and his team tested more than 6,000 different filament materials. Think about that, 6,000. Have you ever done anything 6,000 times? Guys in the room, have you asked out that girl 6,000 times? <laughs> Have you been that persistent? That was at 6,000 different filaments. He was, a, he was an incandescent light bulb stalker, you might say. <laughs> so then in 1881, um, he ultimately found a suitable carbon, carbon material, and at the Paris Exhibition, Edison unveiled his new light bulb. The demonstration was a huge success and proved all of his critics wrong. And you have to imagine that along the way, Edison and his team had many doubts. You know, when you're on filament 5,552, you know, you have to have doubts that this thing is going to work. He surely must have wondered this, yet he continued to work towards his goals in spite of the challenges and risks. What is it that could keep him going in spite of all of those setbacks and all of that um, adversity? I would argue that thing is faith in this idea. Now, a modern example of persistence is the discovery of the Higgs boson. This particle was postulated by several scientists, including Peter Higgs, um, and it had eluded particle physicists for nearly 50 years. Yet they believed with the right equipment they could find it. So that's a picture of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. This is a roughly $10 million project that the community finally, and with this project, they finally had the right equipment to try to prove or disprove Higgs' decades-old theory. Now recently, the Higgs boson is believed to have been detected by two different groups searching for it. 
answering certain important questions of particle physics, while eliciting many more. Now, why would a community of scientists spend five decades, countless billions of dollars, in search of a particle whose only evidence was mathematical or theoretical? Now, that thing is fake. Perhaps it was faith in themselves, or faith in the theory, but it was faith nonetheless. So, now if you still don't believe me, perhaps you'll believe this guy, Lord Voldemort. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, towards the, end, <laughs> towards the end of the final Harry Potter movie, when everyone thinks the chosen one, Harry Potter is dead. Now, I'm not even going to get into all the biblical metaphors of the book about a chosen savior who's killed and then comes back to save his friends. Anyways, Voldemort tells Ginny Weasley, Harry Potter is dead! From this day forth, you put your faith in me. I saw that movie. <laughs> Notice that he doesn't question the existence of faith, just where it should be placed. Even the Dark Lord knows we all have it. So clearly that's not so. So now, why do I bring up all these stories? It's because some people would have you believe that faith and reason are incongruous, like oil and water. This simply isn't the case. Some of the greatest minds in history have employed faith to advance the frontiers of science, many of whom also had faith in God. Examples of people advancing science who also had a faith in God include Max Planck, a pioneer in quantum mechanics, George Lamatra, who first proposed the Big Bang Theory, and Francis Collins, who's the current director of the NIH. And if you ever come to MIT, I can show you a whole host of faculty, whole, whole host of faculty, um, who are also um, believers in Jesus. So when I talk about faith, the faith that you put in people is close to what I mean when I say I have faith in Jesus. This is similar to the faith that I have in my wife. Now, I can't prove without any doubt that she's trustworthy, but no one can prove that about anyone. But I know her well enough to place a lot of confidence in her and to believe that she's worth sharing my life with. If I waited until I believed I had all the evidence, we would never have gotten married. Now, everyone here is familiar with this type of faith. It's necessary for all of, nearly all of our close relationships. Now, this next session, this is a special gift just to the young women in the room. So, just talking to the young women, women in the room. So here's some free relationship advice from Dr. Huey. <laughs> now, if you're dating a guy, for example, and, and you think he's the one, but he tells you that he can't even think about marriage right now, run. <laughs> run far. Now, if he can't conceptualize marriage, that means he hasn't met the one yet, and he's met you. <laughs> Just think about that and let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> really sorry to hurt your feelings, I'm just trying to tell it like it is. So here, here's, a, here's a little secret about guys. Men, young men don't think about marriage. Men think about women. Now, but when a man meets a woman who makes him forget about all the other women, he starts to think about marriage. So, if he's not thinking about marriage, he's not really thinking about you. You deserve better. You want to be his steakhouse, right? But he treats you more like, more like Wendy's. You see, he'll go to the steakhouse every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He'll take his mom to the steakhouse. He's not taking his mom to Wendy's. So don't let him treat you like Wendy's when you're really a steakhouse. Next time he calls you up late at night after several beers, just tell him, Dr. Dewey told me, sorry, sir, the drive through is closed. <laughs> Take my advice, you can put your faith elsewhere. So, what is my argument? My argument is that we don't live in some world where some people employ faith and others do not. Everyone exercises faith. Everyone exercises faith. The bigger question is, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Now, faith is not some purely religious construct. It's, it's essential to human flourishing. Without faith, it would be impossible to make it through life. Whether you've thought about it intently or not, you have faith in a number of things. Perhaps you have faith in the U.S. government? <laughs> now just watch what you say on your cell phone. Maybe you have faith in the goodness of humanity? Or maybe you have faith that one day science will eradicate all the world's major problems, such as hunger and disease. Now it's possible that you've never really thought about these things in this way, so you really have no idea where you put your faith. If you're curious to find out, 
Here's a tip. Just follow your hopes and your fears. Those are clues to where you place your faith. Is your biggest hope to get a good job? Then perhaps your faith is in money. Is your biggest fear to be alone? Then maybe your faith is in human relationships. I suggest you identify where your faith is and test it, just like you would test any scientific hypothesis or theory. How else would you know whether or not your faith is in the right place? So then the next question becomes, how do you test your faith? Now thankfully, life provides all of the tests that you'll ever need. This world is full of challenges and setbacks, and the question is, can your faith handle all of them? There are some forms of faith that are adequate in good times, or in a small subset of life circumstances, but they can't handle everything. Every time you encounter a new challenge in life, you should ask yourself, how does my worldview or my faith account for this situation? Does your faith provide you with adequate answers to all those questions in your mind and on your heart? If not, perhaps you need to place your faith somewhere else. Now, as you can tell, or you might wonder, where is my faith? My faith lies in Jesus Christ. However, it wasn't always there. In fact, when I was growing up, it wasn't there at all. I wasn't the type who grew up in a Christian, um, as a Christian. But when I was a freshman at Ohio State University, I had a roommate who was a Christian. And the way he lived his life was so different from mine that it challenged me to reconsider where I put my faith. This experience led me to put my faith in Jesus, and that faith has surely been tested. The most recent and most vivid test began on June 10, 2010. That's a day I'll never forget. It was a Thursday, and I was in California for a business or research trip. And I was excited to visit some old friends from Stanford, which is where I went to graduate school. Then at around 2 p.m., I received a phone call from my brother-in-law. This was odd to me, because though we were close and on good terms, we didn't talk on the phone very much. However, I learned that this was a special circumstance. He was calling to tell me that my sister, in the picture on the left, that's my sister, on the right, that's me, and the picture on the right is uh, my sister with her husband and, and two young boys, had suddenly and inexplicably, inexplicably passed away. She went to the hospital in pain earlier that day, and before the doctors could even figure out what was wrong, she was dead. The autopsy showed that she had infective endocarditis. This is a situation in which bacteria in the blood clot with platelets to form dangerous vegetations that can ultimately lead to sepsis. There was no notice, no warning. I never even got the chance to say goodbye. Now, it's easy to say your faith is in Jesus Christ, or in anything else for that matter, when life is going well. How does your faith hold up when you have to call your parents to tell them that their daughter, their firstborn child, was dead? The next few weeks and months were some of the toughest of my life. My wife and I were expecting a baby, but I couldn't get over the fact that my son would never meet his aunt. If God is loving, why does he allow tragedies like this? Was this punishment for something that I had done? Now, death is the most natural process of all. I hate to break it to you, but the mortality rate is 100%. <laughs> we all know we're going to die and see others die, but why does it still feel so unnatural? I spent many nights asking these questions in tears, and I must confess that I never got an answer to any of my why questions, but what I did get was something better. All the questions I had about my sister really boiled down to just one. God, how can I believe you love me if you'd allow so much pain? The answer is that through Jesus, I have a God that endured pain. Jesus came and suffered so that we wouldn't have to suffer alone. Jesus came and died so that my sister wouldn't have to die alone. On the cross, Jesus cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? The answer is in this room. It's you and me. We are the reasons why. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the opportunity for fellowship with God. God's son was treated like a sinner, so that sinners like me could be treated like a son. Now, how can I resist a God like that? What is not to love? I'm assured that God loves me because he suffered with me. If you think about it, this is the same way you know that everyone in your life loves you. Can you think of anyone you're close with that hasn't suffered with you? Your parents, 
your siblings, your friends. If your love is deep, you suffer together. I still don't have the answer as to why my sister died, but I do know why not. After this experience with my sister, I realized that faith in Christ answers life's toughest questions. Now, if it can answer the hard ones, surely it must be able to cover the easier ones as well. My question to you is this. Wherever your faith is, does it address all of life's circumstances? I suggest you test it and find out. Families and strong families, then 
It doesn't matter if it's true if the teachings lead to this outcome in life. Um, I actually uh, prescribe more to Paul's, um, I guess Paul's uh, teaching, as you mentioned, on this, in the sense that if it's not true, then, then why do it? I mean, I'm, an, I'm an engineer, right? If Newton's laws aren't true, then I'm not going to use them. Right? So similarly, there's, Jesus didn't come to give them a moral code, right? Because a moral code, as I mentioned, you can find morality in many different uh, in many different contexts. He came to die as Savior. If he if that didn't happen, if that's not true, then there's no need to listen to any of the stuff that he said. So, you know, there are a lot of things that look a lot, that look very fun that you know you're not doing as a Christian. Um, and so, if it's not true, why not do all of that stuff? So that's that's just that's just my perspective. I think it's it's value is far more than than the morality. Because I think if many of us are honest with ourselves, none of us can really live up to any of anything that's mentioned in. And really any moral code. So let, let's give, I'll give one example before going on to the next question. Have you ever really thought about the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Now think, think about that for a moment. What are the things you would like other people to do for you? You would like people to think about you. You would like people to take initiative on your behalf. You would like people to love you unconditionally. You have very, very high standards on how you would like people to treat you. And if anyone steps out of those standards, you become disappointed. Think about the standards you have on others. Have you ever been able to do that for anyone? Like, if you just take the golden rule, none of us can really do that. The golden rule essentially says, go after the well-being of others with the same fervor, the same energy that you go after your own well-being. None of us do that. So even the moral code... If you look at it, if you really try to live up to it, you would find that you'd fall short. So, there must be something more, in my opinion. Well, oh, that's what my voice sounds like. Um, well, my question is, I would love to be doing what you're doing one day, which is um, being a professor at a college. And um, so my first question is dealing with, like, how often do you run into, just being in an academic situation, how often do you run into people either questioning or, or calling out or, The second thing is, I'm a huge avid reader. Um, do you have any books that you would recommend that you kind of come through in your walk that you just have loved? Because um, I would love to read them. Okay, so those are both, both great questions. So the first one, um, have I experienced any kind of belittling or ridicule um, on behalf of my faith? And to date, I would say no. So at least not to my face. Maybe it's just because I'm a large human being. <laughs> they might think it behind my back, but no one's come up to me and said, like, you know, said anything. So um, I, I find actually my colleagues are very respectful and and um, and willing to willing to listen to uh, willing to listen to different perspectives. And I think part of that depends on how you present your perspective. Um, if you present it in a manner such that it's oppressive or I mean, there's some things about Christianity which from the outside are going to look oppressive and are going to look exclusive, but if people see that you really care about them, which I hope you guys can see that. Like, I'm here, you know, fly, you know, all the way from Boston to, to Denver and then drive two and a half hours and it's cold outside and I can't breathe and there's no oxygen. <laughs> like, I'm here because I care about these things and I care about, you know, your, your walks. Other people had conversations like this with me. And so I'm here because I care, and I, I think that people respond to that, even if they disagree with you. Um, to the second question, um, the second question is, uh, I guess, books, uh, books that can be read. Um, I don't know, I think, I think you're already on, on the right track, you just keep reading. Um, you know, the, the Bible talks about, Jesus talks about loving God with your, your heart, your soul, and your mind. And I think... Um, Sometimes Christians have been perhaps rightly accused of loving God with just their, just their heart and perhaps checking their mind at the door. Um, and I'm not a big proponent of that. I've actually found that as I've tried to delve more into the tougher issues of Christianity intellectually, it's only strengthened my faith. And so I guess my, my advice would be to keep reading. Um, there's a book that, um, that I'm reading now called Genesis and the Big Bang. Um, it's quite interesting. It's about a biophysicist who basically makes the argument that a literal interpretation of Genesis um, is actually, could be scientifically plausible. 
Um, I'm not going to get into all of it, but it you know, makes some relativistic arguments about how, from God's perspective, one day could actually have been millions or billions of years if you think about things relativistically. So but I can't get into to all of it because he writes a whole book on it. But um, I personally, I find things like that fascinating. When I first became a Christian, um, I'm not going to lie, the, the creation story was an issue with me. I didn't, I didn't know how to reconcile it. Now, it wasn't such an issue that it um, precluded me from putting my faith in Christ. Um, like I said, faith is something you do with incomplete evidence. I didn't know exactly how to reconcile what I knew about science with the creation story. But as I've looked into it more, I've only become more, more confident. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think reading is, you know, fundamental. <laughs> so I think you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, I met you earlier today at, the, at your talk. Um, I kind of have two questions. Uh, they should be short and they're completely unrelated. But my first one is related to anything? Or? No, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. So, my first one is um, being a mechanical engineering major uh, and talking with a lot of friends and getting into kind of apologetic discussions. I always go back to the second law of thermodynamics, and I was just wondering if you could expand on that, if you've ever used that in conversations with colleagues or friends. And my second one was, I saw a video on the Veritas website where you were at a, another university and someone asked you why, um, how do you know God is real to you or something and your answer was, uh, you made an analogy with like earthly parents, do you remember? I was just wondering if you could like, Say how you said that, just so many, <laughs> so everyone can benefit from that. Because that, that was just like a cool answer. Okay. Do you know? I, you remember? I, I, I vaguely remember. I will. I will try. Let me go to. The, let me go to the first one. Okay. The first one being the second law of thermodynamics. So I happen to teach thermodynamics, um, and so I'm not going to give you a lecture on thermodynamics. How many people here are just vaguely familiar with the second law of thermodynamics? Okay, so the first law, the first law of thermodynamics is relatively easy to grasp so that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right, so if you have a closed system, the amount of energy in that system, it can change form. Thermal energy can change to mechanical engineering or energy or vice versa. Chemical energy can change to electrical, but the total amount of energy is conserved. Now the second law effectively puts a one-way sign on the universe. So there's a from the first law of thermodynamics, I've got this glass of water, which is cold, right? The first law of thermodynamics will not tell me which direction heat will transfer. From the first law of thermodynamics, heat could transfer from this cold water to the outside air. That does not violate the first law of thermodynamics. But our experience tells us that's not actually what happens. What actually happens is heat transfer always occurs from a warmer body to a cooler body. And so effectively, it puts a one-way sign the second law puts a one-way sign on the universe. The universe is always increasing in entropy. Entropy being the amount of, um, some would say disorder, sometimes I don't like that, um, like that definition, but even the amount of disorder, we'll say, um, in the universe. So if I am a hot molecule, and if a hot molecule transferring its energy to something colder, the amount of disorder in the universe goes up as this heat is transferred to this colder body. And so because of that, the universe is always changing. The universe will never be the same. So even us sitting right here, right now, entropy is being generated, right? So the universe can never go back to its state where it had less entropy than it did a minute ago, right? Because the universe, the entropy can never be destroyed. It can only be created. And so our world is going towards a state of basically uniform everything, maximum entropy would be everything, um, everything, if, if you look it up, it's called like the entropy death of the universe. And this actually fits very well with um, the biblical description of what's happening to the world. The world is running down, the world is, um, there will be, there will be an end. Things are not going to last forever. Um, that concept kind of can be reconciled with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, 
I guess uh, with respect to the parents, um, to be honest, I can't remember the exact question. It was that was. It was you, uh, they asked you, "How do you know God is real?" And then you answer with, "How do you know?" Oh, I remember now. I remember now. I remember now. So, quick, quick question here: How many people have ever gotten a genetic test? To show that their parents are who they say they are. <laughs> so, so just, so just, uh, just one. I actually haven't done it. Um, you notice, you you take your parents at their word. How do you know that your parents? You could have been switched at birth. You really, you actually don't honestly know. So people will apply to. I've heard, I've heard many people come and they'll talk about. They'll talk about God and they'll say, well, I want to see the definitive proof. Until I see the definitive proof that God exists, I will not believe in God. But you can get definitive proof that your parents are who they say they are, yet you don't do it. Why is it that you don't do it? You have all kinds of other evidence. You have a relationship. You have pictures. You have memories. You have all kinds of other things. Even though you can get the definitive proof that your parents are who they say they are, you haven't done it because you use all this relational information. What is wrong with using that same relational information with God? God has written a love letter called the Bible. God has blessed you in so many ways. There's all these, there's all kinds of relational evidence you have for God, and yet you're holding him to a higher standard than you even would hold your own parents. So if I, sometimes I say this for people that say, well, I want to see the definitive proof that God is who he says he is. Well, go get the proof of your parents, and then I'll believe that you're the type of person that will only believe things if you have the definitive proof. You're taking, your parents are, you're taking that on faith. Because you don't honestly know, and in this case, you could actually figure it out. And in many ways, even asking for the test would be disrespectful to your parents. Think about that. Your parents, for the parents in the room, the parents in the room know this. And for those of you who are who are who are not parents, if you go to your parents and ask them, you know, I'm going to get a test just to make sure. I'm going to be 100 percent sure. You know, I, I, don't, I feel like I'm a little smarter than you guys, and I'm not totally sure that we are the same gene pool. Uh, they're going to they're going to feel they're going to feel disrespected. So. Dr. Buey, there's a few love letters out there telling me who my parents are. I see the Quran. I see the Bible. I've seen some really funny ones out there, like uh, Scientology. In your search for Veritas, the truth, what has led you logically to believe that Christianity is the one true faith, the ultimate truth? Further, with people who speak with just as much conviction as yourself, who have a greater education, why would they disagree with you? Okay, so I think this is a, I think this is a great question. Um, as I mentioned before, when I when I came to faith, it wasn't uh, it wasn't by convenience. It was um, it was by experience. So I had a, I had a friend, and watching his life, I just saw the evidence of his life being different. Now that in and of itself doesn't make Christianity true, but it did pique my interest. And so since becoming a Christian, I've constantly read and tried to to understand more and more about the faith. Because when I first became a Christian, I had doubts. And even now, I still have doubts. I have maybe fewer doubts now than I did then, but um, I'm not going to say that I have 100% no doubt about anything. Right? There are things about the Bible that, you know, that I don't understand. Um, and I wrestle with those things. Now, one of the things that, uh, helpful things I've heard about this is, you know, this can be one of the, one of the tests that you have a real God as opposed to a, um, as opposed to a, a made-up God is that a real God, if there's a real God who has a real personality and really has agency, that God can disagree with you, right? And think of any of your friends, think of any relationship you have. One of the ways you know you have a real relationship is sometimes you disagree, or sometimes you don't understand one another. And so I think part of the evidence that I know God is real is that I don't understand everything. It doesn't, God doesn't just do everything that I say, right? God has, he has his own agency. Um, now with respect to, um, to other people and other faiths, um, I can't make a judgment on other people and their faith. Um, I think that um, there are tons of brilliant people that have come to other conclusions. 
and I, it, doesn't I don't, it doesn't take anything away from them. I've come to mind, and I haven't seen anything yet to lead me to, one, discard it, or two, pick up, uh, pick up something else. Um, and so I certainly don't know everything. There are people out there that have studied these things more than me. Some of them have come to different conclusions, and some of them have come to the same conclusions as me. So that also gives me some, you know, gives me some, uh, um, I guess, uh, some, some encouragement. So there are people out there who have studied this their whole life, and they've come to the same conclusion. So um, I think that's a great question. I try to, I hope it's come off this way, and I apologize if it hasn't. I try to be humble in the sense that, that I, I don't know everything. And, um, you know, next year you guys might have a forum and there will be someone else up here that prescribes to a different faith and they might be more eloquent or more brilliant. Um, it's not going to change my perception of the truth, but I think that there's, um, I don't know, I think personally I think that these discussions need to be had. I think that's, that's one of the biggest things is we live in a society these days where it's very difficult to talk to people about different beliefs of any sort. It's hard for Republicans to talk to Democrats. It's hard for black people to talk to white people, it's hard for um, Muslims to talk to Christians. Like we're never going to understand each other's perspective unless we have a little bit of humility about ourselves and are willing to listen to others, so. Um, my question um, deals with, what do you think that Jesus and the Christian worldview offers that other worldviews don't? So I think that's a, that's a great question. So the, the essential difference between Christianity and other worldviews, as I understand them, is really, it's really the gospel. It's the gospel. It's not morality. It's not, you know, the collection of stories. It's the gospel. It's this radical idea that we are all, something inside of us is so unfortunately wrong and twisted that we need a savior. And at the same time, God loves us so much that rather than um, condemning us all, he condemned himself essentially. There's, I don't think that there's another worldview that says that the path to salvation is not something that requires work. Basically, everything else is about work. It's about meditation. It's about prayer. It's about good works. It's, it's, it, it tells you that you can actually do it on your own. And Christianity says you can't do it on your own. And thus, it puts us all on the exact same page. You don't have to be someone who, you know, studies in a monastery for 50 years to understand it. Everyone in this room can have salvation today, tonight. It doesn't take some level of education. It basically puts everyone on the same page. And I don't know that there's another worldview that says that the path to God has already been paved by God. God himself came down, did everything for you, and said, this is how you, um, you, would, you earn, you achieve salvation. Then, once you've achieved that salvation, now you go out and you're a moral person and you do good things, but it's out of gratitude. It's not out of trying to save yourself. It's just because you love God and you love your fellow, your fellow man. And so it gives you the opportunity to, in its most genuine form, it gives you the opportunity to love people for themselves. Because right? you can, uh, and this is a phenomenon today, you can be a very generous person, but not even doing it for the people, right? You could be, a, you could be a, a worker for the Red Cross and doing it just so that you can tell your friends, oh, I, I work for the Red Cross, I'm such a good person. It's not even about the people that you're serving. Christianity gives you the opportunity to really serve people for them because your service to them does not impact your salvation. You're already saved. So you can do it just for the people. So that's my um, description on you know what is different, but that's a that's a great that's a great question. Last question. <laughs> well, after you're done, I have a question for you guys, so I'll, I'll ask. Them. <laughs> so my question is: um, Can faith test interpretations be resolved with rigor and accuracy? Watched your other three talks on Veritas, and um, yeah, I came up with a bunch of questions. But that's pretty much the what I'm most interested in. And the reason why is because I'm curious how we can avoid like confirmation and disconfirmation bias, or avoid um, selective reading or misinterpretation. And it seems like most personal faith tests would be centered around 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, can faith can faith tests be resolved with rigor? I think I think that they can. I think that the Bible offers, for example, many uh, many promises about life, um, promises of peace, promises of, um, of you know how your life will generally go. Um, now, mind you. In this world, you have to be careful with promises because sometimes they can be taken out of context. You have to read them in context. But I think many of the promises in the Bible can be directly tested. For So, for example, one of my favorite verses is in Philippians. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, uh, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that's something, I'm a naturally anxious person, right? And so that's been something I've had to test. Um, if I do this thing, do I get this, does this outcome actually occur in my life? Now, another thing that you can do, and I think this leads to um, what's going to happen after this, is I think, personally, I believe the Bible is like an engineering textbook. Maybe it's because I'm an engineer, I see everything as an engineering textbook. But it's, so in, in an engineering textbook, there are physical theories presented, and then there's the application of those physical theories to practical engineering problems that you have to solve um, in problem sets that are always at the end of the chapter. So you read the book, uh, you read a chapter, and then at the end of the chapter there are problem sets that you have to work out. And any, any engineering student or professor will tell you, you don't really know it until you work those problems out. And I think the Bible is similar. If you read the Bible like um, an encyclopedia, you're not, really, you're not really doing it. The Bible is meant to be worked out. It's meant to be Get a study group, just like you would do in an engineering class. It's meant to have a teacher. It's meant to be worked out. So where it's a promise is given, you should read that promise and then go home and do the homework and try to see, does that actually apply to your life? If you actually apply the Bible in that way and you find that it doesn't seem to work for you, then I would say you've done a, you've done a valid test. In some, in some ways, people will say, oh, well, I've read the Bible. and Well, the Bible isn't something just to be read. It's meant to be worked out in my opinion. And I think, you know, afterwards there are going to be discussion groups out here um, for people who really want to, to work this thing out. Um, not just say, oh, I'm familiar with Christianity, but to really say you tried it, you need to read it, you need to do it in a group, and then you need to try to do the things that it says in a group um, faithfully. And if you do all those things, then I'd say you've given it a, a rigorous, uh, rigorous attempt. So I have, I have a question for you guys. Um, what is the beer song? <laughs> can, can, can anybody sing the song for me? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. That's why we drink it here, right here. When we run from beer, our friends will be drinking all the beer. This is the first time that there is no beer in heaven. How do you know that? <laughs> that doesn't sound like heaven to me. The Bible I read, Jesus turned water to wine. If he turned water to wine on earth, who knows what's in heaven? <laughs> so be careful with that song. You know, there might be some bad theology in that song. Right, thanks. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.